In this video, we're going to talk about covalent bonding and naming covalent structures. Um, so ignore that. Uh, so covalent bonds are different from ionic bonds in that they occur when electrons are shared between two atoms. And so an electron would be attracted to two nuclei rather than to just one. Um, and that sharing of an electron uh, really changes that binding compared to an ionic compound, which is electrostatic forces of opposite charges being drawn together. And so uh, it's important to know then that bond that's created between those two atoms is always going to be a two electron bond if it's a single bond. So each bond is equivalent to two electrons. Typically, we think of that as one electron from each atom being shared with the other. Um, there are examples where it's two electrons from one atom being shared with another atom. Um, I, I we'll get into that a lot more at the end of this quarter when we talk about covalent bonding in detail. Um, so it's, it's also important to note that when these, these atoms share electrons in this way, they form a molecule rather than just a compound, which is like a subset of compounds. And so that molecule is going to be a discrete group of atoms that are held together by those covalent bonds. Um, and so these typically happen when two nonmetals combine or a metal metalloid bonds with a nonmetal. Um, but that's uh, a pretty broad generalization uh, that the amount of covalent nature a bond has um, depends a lot on electronegativity and, and also the environment around it. And so we actually have examples of a fair number of them of metals and nonmetals forming covalent bonds, essentially. My favorite example is iron and sulfur that do this. So while we use, especially when we first start learning about chemistry, we use metal and nonmetal means an ionic bond and nonmetal and nonmetal means a covalent bond as like a general rule because a lot of compounds follow that, that guideline, but not all of them. And, and it doesn't explain why it's happening. It's more of a pattern you can, you can see applied. And so since we are going to spend so much time on bonding on covalent molecules at the end of the quarter, I, we won't really talk about it here. Um, but we do want to give you some naming conventions because in theory, you'd be going into the lab right away. Um, we want you to be able to navigate chemical bottles and labels. So in general, the way that we handle writing um, covalent molecules is we write the, the first um, name of the element with the, the smallest group number first. Um, so we're gonna walk through an example with some nitrogen and oxygen. And so that nitrogen is in the fifth group and oxygen is in the sixth. And so nitrogen would be written first. So smallest group, write that one first. Since we don't have the cation anion rule to, roll, to follow. Um, so now if they're in the same group, then we would write the element that has the greatest row number first. So if we were looking at uh, fluorine and chlorine somehow bonding together, then we would uh, have the chlorine written first because it has a, a larger um, atomic number or it's in a, the greatest row number. It'd be in row three rather than row two. And so that helps us figure out which one to do first. Um, then we're going to give the name of the element a prefix, and that prefix is going to correspond to the number of atoms present. And the prefixes are going to look the same as the uh, hydrate prefixes we used earlier, except we won't have the hemi option because we would not have half of an atom in a covalent molecule. But mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, na, na, nana, <laughs> and DECA are our prefixes that we're going to use in covalent naming. Um, and if there's, there's only one atom and it's the first element, we would typically say mono, then the element. But we usually omit that because if we're saying the name, it's uh, implied that there's at least one, right? But we only do this for the first one. So an example would be uh, carbon and oxygen bonded together. Um, this would be mono carbon, mono oxide. And we emit the mono on the first one only. And so we get carbon monoxide, where we keep the mono for the second one. 
Now, this IDE is another thing to raise. Um, the second element that's written will have that IDE ending that we had for the anion and covalent or ionic bonding. It doesn't mean it has a negative charge. Um, and, and we would recognize that because we would see um, uh, the naming structure tell us it was a covalent molecule rather than an ionic molecule with the inclusion of the prefixes and also the lack of a metal typically. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do here, so for this one, nitrogen with two oxygens, we would have mono nitrogen, but since it's the first one, we don't include it. Our first element is just named off the periodic table the way it appears there, just like we did with ionic bonding. Then we have two oxygens, so that two translates into a di prefix. And then we add the IDE ending on our oxygen, uh, so we get nitrogen dioxide. Now, if I have two oxygen and four, or sorry, two nitrogen and four oxygen, then I am going to use a prefix to show that I have two nitrogens. I'll use di, and it'll be dinitrogen. Again, I don't use a, a suffix. I don't change the word nitrogen at all since it comes first. Um, then I use uh, tetra for four in front of the oxygen and I change the ending to IDE. So when I see these prefixes, it's a big red flag that I have an organic or a uh, covalent molecule that I'm working with rather than a um, ionic compound. And now there's a, a lot of naming conventions that branch off this basic form because that will really only cover some of our most simple molecules. And a, a lot of those naming conventions, I'm going to leave for you to learn in organic chemistry because they'll go into great detail with it. Um, one I wanna mention because it's something that we'll work with a lot in general chemistry is acids and acid naming. Um, similar to oxy anions, uh, acids are something that we use a lot. And so it's also something that it's good to know how to be safe around it and the more you can read labels around acids, the better. Um, so uh, the definition of an acid in general is that there is a, a hydrogen that can be lost. And it's typically written in a formula that has that hydrogen as the first element um, to indicate that it's a hydrogen that could um, react in a, a, an acid-base reaction. Um, so we're gonna cover binary acids and oxy acids. And let's look at binary acids first. So these contain only two elements. One example is H2S right here. And the way we would name them, um, other one, examples would be hydro, HCl, HF, HBr. Um, yeah. Uh, so for these, we're gonna have a hydro be the beginning of our name followed by the base name of the element. And we're gonna give it an ICE ending and then follow it with acid. So here I have hydrogen and sulfur, right? So I'm gonna focus on the non-hydrogen element and name based on that. And so that's gonna be sulfur. And what I'm gonna to do to that name from my periodic table is I'm gonna add a hydro at the beginning. I'm gonna cut that uh, ending, sorry. I'm going to add the IC, IC ending, and then I'm going to put acid at the very end. And what I love about the naming conventions around acid is they always say acid at the end, to be, so you're really sure. Like, hey, it's an acid. Be careful. So we'd have hydrosulfuric acid. All right, let's try an oxy acid now. So the only thing that distinguishes an oxy acid from a binary acid is that it has oxygen involved. So if there's oxygen, you have an oxy acid, kind of like if there was oxygen and it was an anion, you have an oxy anion. So for these ones, we're going to do a base name with an IC ending or an OUS ending followed by acid. And that IC versus OUS depends on if it is a uh, oxy anion with a ITE ending as an anion or an ATE ending. And so if you have the ITE ending on an anion for your acid, you would have OUS. And if you had ATE, you would have 
I see for your ending. And so this is getting back to how many oxygens you have relatively. So I have less oxygens present in HClO2. So since there's less oxygen, I would give it an ITE ending if that hydrogen wasn't there. I can also ignore this hydrogen and look for ClO2 minus in my polyatomic ion chart. And I'll see that it uh, has an ITE ending, it's chloride. Um, and if I have more oxygens, then I would have an ATE ending as an anion, but for my acid, I'm gonna have the IC ending. So more oxygen is ick, less oxygen is us. And for anions, it was eight and eight.